if you have no awareness of that, then really you're completely neglecting this part of the equation, which is really all that your muscles do. And so this is like, I still really, really supposedly smart people will talk about load on the bar, load in the pin, load on your back, load on a machine, as if it's synonymous with this, which it's not, which is, I, there's no other way to say it. I won't say it, it's special for someone to say that. Again, the number one thing that people have to orchestrate, I won't ever name names, but some really, really smart people forget that if you're drawing diagrams accurately, that bar has to stay over midfoot. Because I've seen some people do some interesting things drawing. I've seen people do some interesting things demonstrating with a broomstick, but as soon as you're using more weight than your body weight, that bar is the bigger influence on your center of mass. And if your center of mass doesn't stay over your base of support, you fall over. So again, that's form number one you generally don't have to teach people is don't fall over. And this is what they're orchestrating is this, there'll be a teeny tiny bit of this, you know, your feet and ankle can actually compensate. That's the reason that I can go like this, I can go like this. So you can deviate a tiny bit and obviously you can compensate entirely with feet and ankle muscles, but at some point in time, it gets further enough away, you fall over. So when we're looking at that, that's the first thing that's gonna dictate is that bar path has to stay right over midfoot the entire time. When things are stacked, where are the moment arms in this one? So if we're looking moment arm things, what are the joints of influence? Let's just say for simple purposes, what are the main joints we're looking at and when we're looking at a squat? Hips and, knees. Hips and knees, yeah. So technically like anything, if anybody ever wants a super nerd, like this influences basically every single joint to some degree from point of application down. But as far as we're concerned, we're looking mainly at hips and knees. So that line of force, where is that distance from the line of force to the axis of the joints there? It's basically, there's no distance. It's just passing right through it. So if we do these again, it's always where it's the closest or 90 degree angle. So there's a moment arm and there's a moment arm. So there's where we're basically kind of going halfway down. Now again, so if I, the whole example again, if I had you hold 400 pounds right here, how long could you hold it? A long time. Obviously there's some shit going on, of course, right? So it's not like it's just sitting there by magic. Or if I said, all right, now you've got to hold it at the midpoint, how long could you hold it? Not as long, right? So as soon as things deviate off, now you have that line of force expressing joint at your knee, expressing joint at your hips. As you go to the bottom of the squat, what happens? So we have the same thing again, if we're looking at line of force, again, it has to be 90 degree angle. It's almost 90 degree. And so this one's gonna be down here, 90 degree angle. So this is the line of force to the knee. This is the line of force to the hip. Make sense? So you don't have to know the numbers. If you really want to nerd, you could. But so basically, torque equals moment arm times force. So that is the equation for joint torque. So again, when we're looking at, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but what the hell. When you're looking at what your muscles do, your muscles manage torque at joints. That's important, write that down. Your muscles manage torque at joints. They don't create motion, because that's not, they don't always do that. They can create contractions that don't move things. They can control motions, eccentrics. They can cause motion concentrics. But the most accurate thing you can say is they manage torque at joints. Um, so again, people talk about this tensiony type thing. Muscles create tension or manage tension. Well, that's kind of not the wrong, not the wrong thing, but it can be a little bit confusing. They manage torque at joints, and obviously they produce force to potentially do something as a result of this torque in the force of tension force, right? So from force from the muscle creating tension. So the reason I always say this and I write this one out is not to sound, you don't have to know pretty much any equation ever to know anything about lifting, but you should have some idea of this. Why is that? Because if we're looking at something, so if we're looking at a squat, what is this? This is the number that everybody knows. What is that number? Weight. weight. You log book it, right? You write it down. Everybody writes down their weight. Seems like a pretty good idea. In this equation, which is the whole thing that we're doing, is where far as what this stuff has influence on this stuff. So obviously this you know, equation over here results in this. Which one is more important? This is the question, how do equations work? They have the same influence. They're equally important. So literally not like a, you know, it's not like something like qualitative, like, oh, this is important because my muscle connection or whatever, like this is an equation. These two things are of equal importance. So I used to joke if people were really into shit now, they, you don't have to because generally your form is standardized, so moment arms don't change. 
So if you want a logbook, technically I'm gonna write down numbers and I'm gonna write down moment arms because they're technically both just as important. But that's practically probably not necessarily gonna happen. But if you have no awareness of that, then really you're completely neglecting this part of the equation, which is really all that your muscles do. And so this is like, I still really, really supposedly smart people will talk about load on the bar, load in the pin, load on your back, load on a machine, as if it's synonymous with this, which it's not, which is, I, there's no other way to say it. I won't say it. It's special for someone to say that. Um, so if we're looking at this, well, why is that important? What's the pattern of this? So let's say you've got 400 pounds on your back. So this is 400. This is 400. This is 400. So again, we don't have to know the numbers and you don't have to know any numbers. So I like to do this is small and this is big. Let's call this one and this is two. And this is one, this looks like maybe three. So as you go up here and it's zero, well obviously zero times weight is basically zero. That's why we said there's no challenge here. So we go here and we multiply it by something, you know, let's call this a foot or let's call it two feet or whatever we want to call it. You multiply that by the moment arm. So again, we multiply, excuse me, moment arm by 400 and now we have 400 foot pounds of torque or inch pounds of torque or whatever you want to call it. As you go to the bottom and that distance doubles, you get literally double the torque, right? So you don't have to know exactly the numbers, but this is from infinitely harder here and literally twice as hard at the bottom because of that torque thing. Does that make sense? So if we're looking purely at what your muscles have to manage in this equation, this literally looks probably from the midpoint to the bottom. This looks almost three times as hard. This almost looks two times as hard. If we're using hard, torque is probably the most accurate thing to talk about that is hard. Does that make sense? Are there any questions on that so far? So if we're going through a squat, if you're picking a weight for your squat, how, what are you picking your weight based on? What's the limiting factor here? The load you can manage at the bottom. And so again, if I can manage, again, let's make up a number, let's call this you know, um, 12 inches. So we've got 12 inch pounds of torque times, let's do 100 pounds so I don't confuse myself. <laughs> but we've got 1200 inch pounds of torque at the bottom. Your knee is capable of, let's say this is 36 inches. Again, that'd be a really freaking long femur, but whatever, it's three times as long. We have 3,600 inch pounds of torque that we have at the bottom. So if your quad is capable of managing that, since that's pretty much the only thing that manages knee extension at that bottom, you're picking a weight based off of that. What's happening in this position, in these positions? You're using a third or using half of what you're capable of using. You're essentially under training that position, right? So if I look at what I'm capable of doing in this position, because the length changes here. So the length from going from a lengthened quad, lengthened glute, to mid-range quad, to mid-range glute, your strength output doesn't change a whole lot. So you're technically capable of similar amounts in both positions. So essentially when you're at the bottom here, you're picking the weight that you can do there and you're under training here. Or this makes more sense, like why, how, does every, how does everyone all around the world know the same way to cheat, right? It's the one thing we have in common. You go to gyms all around the world and everyone cheats the same way. Like, did they all go to school to learn how to cheat? Is there a cheat course being taught out there and somebody doesn't know? How do they inherently know? They inherently, people inherently know profiles. All they know is even though it's the same weight, moving either, let's move 12 inches at the top, or should I move 12 inches at the bottom? No one needs any help making that decision. They <laughs> squatters. So this is, why, this is why quarter squatters exist. When they put 405 on their back and they quarter squat, they're just matching their capability based on the moment arms they can tolerate. You've all seen it. What happens when a quarter squatter just gets a little overzealous one day and gets into that third squatter range? They just, everything <laughs> crumble, it's all over. And that's why it crumbles, it's the same distance. Why can't they do six inches at the bottom, but they can do six inches at the top? It's because it could be two, three times as much challenge based on that moment arm, based on that torque thing. So if we looked at, let's match what I'm capable of doing all through this range of motion, maybe I'm capable here if let's say hypothetically, I can tolerate, you know, again, making what numbers did I say? I can tolerate 3,600 inch pounds of torque here. If I can tolerate the same amount of torque here, but my moment arm is smaller, what would I have to do? If I, the moment arm is getting smaller, is there any way that I can keep torque consistent? Increase the force, increase the weight. And so basically that's the whole point when we come to accommodating resistance, chains, bands like that. Moment arms are gonna change as you go through that pattern. And if you want to match what you're capable of doing there, as moment arms are going to, you're going to stand up. You can't change where your joints end up, but you can change the load with the idea of basically keeping it more consistent. So if I look at torque expression at a joint, what am I capable of doing as I go through this? Or I look at force expression on my back. I'm capable of doing 
you know, the uh, consistent amount the whole way through. But if I look at basically my pushing output here, this is where you get the ascending profile from. I'm capable of pushing 400 pounds on my back here, 600 pounds on my back here, 800 pounds on my back here, whatever. And so if you drew an ascending profile, this was the pattern of an ascending profile for a squat pattern as you went from, you know, the, the bottom of the concentric. So if this is the concentric going this way, it would essentially look like this, going from the bottom of the range of motion to the top. It has an ascending profile. So if you've heard people say, this is why this is an ascending profile, that's what that means. Your force expression at the contact point of the load basically increases as you go through the concentric range of motion.